Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephen Teach, and it is my great pleasure to introduce this morning's Grand Round speakers. Before we get started, just out of courtesy to them, if everybody could take a moment to silence your cell phones and pagers. You know, I've been at Children's National a long time, and, and I'm continually impressed when you scratch slightly below the surface of our amazing staff, our amazing faculty members. You find amazing things. And this morning's Grand Round uh, is a good illustration of that. We feature two uh, attendings from our Division of Emergency Medicine, Dr. Lenore Jarvis and uh, Dr. Nancy Cotwell, and they share uh, a really incredible experience. Both have participated in the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. And today they're going to, uh, and they this morning have formed a base, uh, Grand Round based on that shared experience. And uh, the program, and I will quote, brings together leaders from multiple sectors to learn leadership skills firsthand from four uh, presidents, Presidents uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, George W. Bush, uh, William Jefferson Clinton, and Lyndon Baines Johnson. And uh, the aim is to produce bold and principled leaders who are focused on solving society's toughest challenges and creating uh, measurable change. Dr. Scottwell and Jarvis, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity for us to come share this experience with you. Um, I want to start off by saying that for our colleagues who are fasting today, we wish you a safe and healthy fast. Um, we know that this is a little bit atypical of a Grand Rounds, but this is a really unique and exciting opportunity for us to learn leadership lessons through a curriculum created by the four presidential libraries. Um, this is an opportunity for us to tell you about our experience. It's going to be a little bit of a whirlwind. We're distilling 120 hours of curricula down to an hour for you. Um, but we just thought it was such an amazing experience for us to be able to participate in this program. And we wanted to share the lessons learned as it applies to physician medicine here today with you. We do not have any disclosures for you. We're not getting paid by the presidential uh, leadership scholars program, we kind of wish we were, but um, today our objectives, we hope that you will be able to recognize ways to cultivate your personal leadership styles to meet goals and address challenges. We hope that you'll be able to identify leadership skills to advance your pediatric practice, career, and academic teams. And we hope that you'll be able to describe tactics to increase your influence and impact as a leader. For a moment, I would actually like to bring up another colleague from the Presidential Leadership College Program to the stage. It's Michael O'Leary. So Michael is a Professor of Leadership, Management, and Innovation and Faculty Chair of the Undergraduate Program of Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. He has also taught in seven of the school's eight master's programs and dozens of executive education programs. Apropos of today's session, he has also co-designed this presidential leadership, or we'll start calling it PLS for short, this PLS program, and has taught at the PLS program, so he was one of our instructors during this program. Um, he has been an instructor for all five years of the program. Michael? Morning. Uh, Lenore and Monty asked me to say just a little bit about the history and the evolution of the program and talk briefly about its goals, and then they're going to share a little bit more about their own personal experience and the experience of some of their colleagues. But uh, Presidents Bush and Clinton uh, came and had an idea for a program that would bring people together across different uh, areas of interest, different specialty areas in medicine, but also different areas of society more broadly, politics, business, law, education, the arts, uh, medicine, and came to us and asked for help designing it. And so the program was uh, five years old this year. We'll celebrate our fifth class. Every year, 60 people are admitted into the program. It's fully funded by donors. And those 60, Lenore and Monzi, are chosen uh, these days from about 1,000 applicants every year. Uh, those 1,000 applicants uh, get winnowed down to 60 amazing people who spend six modules over six months working with uh, the four presidential centers, two Republican, two Democrat, uh, in an attempt to try to build social change uh, in their communities with 
community defined, in some cases very locally, a hospital, a medical center, in other cases a region or a state, and in some cases the world. But the idea is to bring together the experience of the presidents, the experience of their staffs, uh, some faculty, and an amazing network now of 300 scholars. And in many ways, the benefits of the program outlive the program itself because they really are manifest in the ongoing interaction of people like Monzi and Lenore and the work that they do with each other and with the rest of their community. So uh, the program has a few key component parts, um, meeting with, learning from, going deep with uh, the living presidents and the two who passed away, working with faculty uh, to see what the combination of art and science is regarding leadership, uh, working on their own personal leadership projects, and I think we'll see a couple examples of those projects and the core values that are behind them in just a moment. And then, as I said, the network of scholars that is at the heart of PLS. In there. Got somebody walking down the hall there. <laughs> Got it. Um, so when we created the program, the idea was to identify a series of leadership uh, skills, approaches that were teachable. Uh, there are many things about leadership agree on, but aren't necessarily the kinds of things that you could learn, certainly not learn over the course of six modules and 120 hours. So what's teachable? What can you actually learn and improve uh, in a relatively short period of time? What's transferable? So what could we do in this context that would be applicable for people across a wide variety of industries and sectors? Uh, for example, you might, you know, you could imagine a program where you would learn about financial management and budgeting and how that can be an important leadership tool in essence, but it's very hard to do that in a way that would be equally applicable to someone in a hospital and somebody in a corporation or in a nonprofit. Uh, and then where could we use the presidential examples for good and in some cases not so good uh, as deep dive opportunities to explore things like persuasion and influence, like effective communication, like good decision making, and like how to create strategic partnerships and long-term relationships. So that was the foundation of the program and uh, the, the magic of it is in people like Lenore and Monty who came into it already doing amazing things and already being accomplished leaders in their own right, but we're interested in taking their leadership to the next level and then joining an amazing community of fellow leaders. Uh, so it's wonderful to have them. It's fantastic for me to have been a part of the program for these last five years. And uh, we've got an amazing morning hearing a little bit more about those 120 hours. So, you know, kind of before we get started, we just kind of want to both um, tell you why we joined the program or why we applied. Um, so for me, it was kind of very similar to what um, Michael was talking about, but I learned about this program through a friend, and I think the biggest thing that struck out was the community that he formed. Um, I really wanted to be a part of a diverse group of individuals who were striving to make a change, learn from them, grow with them, and get like a formal kind of structured training on leadership and how it applies to social impact. I think Monsi said it well. Um, I did not know about the program. Monsi did it the year before me, and she basically told me I had to apply. But um, after she explained what it was, I thought it was a really unique and exciting opportunity. Um, in particular, I just think that we spend a lot of time as physicians learning how to be a really good clinician. And inherently, we have a lot of different times in which we are asked to be leaders, yet we don't really risky formal leadership training. And so I thought it was a really great time for me, um, kind of leaving fellowship and entering my attending career here at Children's National to get a little bit more formalized education on how to be a good leader. Um, I think that, you know, Monty told me, but I didn't really realize until I entered the program that the cohort of people, the 60 classmates that uh, we had, were also just awe-inspiring that to be in a room, and we get this sometimes at the hospital or when we go to conferences, but to be in a room of people who, you know, actively seek change in the world that are very social justice oriented, it's really exciting. And then it's hard to leave those cohorts feeling like you are not charged with yourself making a difference in your area. And so that was part of why um, I chose to do this program. 
Um, so we wanted to kind of talk about the, um, an exercise that we did really early on in the program. I think it was the first week, and it was about kind of core values and really defining our core values and, most importantly, our North Star. Um, you would think that, you know, this would be really easy to think about what drives you on a daily basis, but to really narrow it down to that one thing that you feel is the thing that drives you on a daily basis is actually really difficult. And um, when I was doing this exercise, you know, I was thinking about things that would, um, you know, kind of um, impact me both personally and professionally. But a lot of people that um, were around me were actually having a difficult time because there's kind of sometimes different things that guide you in different aspects of your life. So we wanted to do um, a mini exercise with you um, as quickly as we can here in a short time. Um, but really kind of think about it in whatever way is meaningful to you. So whether it's personally, whether it's professionally, whether it's a concept that marries both. Um, so if you guys could just take a couple minutes um, to look at this slide, um, think about five different um, areas that really resonate with you. If there's something that's not on here, you know, please feel free to incorporate that into your list. Um, you can jot it down, you can say it in your head, um, and I'll give you about a minute to just kind of think about the thing today. Now, if you can take those five and try to narrow it down to three, even if it's something that's just a tiny fraction less important than um, the other three that are on there, the five that are on there, um, I'm going to give you about 20 seconds to do that. And now lastly, try to narrow it down to just that one North Star, that one core value that you just can't live without, that thing that drives you every single day. How did you guys feel? Was that hard? Did you guys come up with something, I guess, in your head? I'm not going to have you guys share it out loud, but, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, if you can do that in this short of time, that's awesome. But obviously, if this is something that, you know, you need a little bit more time on, please go home. Please think about it. Because if you think about it, if you can get that one core value that is always on the forefront of your mind every single day, you're going to have a better sense of vision, a better sense of purpose in your life for everything that you do. And that's one of the things that we um, talked about really early on, and that kind of helped guide us throughout this entire program and the projects that we were doing, the people that we were meeting, the conversations that we were having um, really kind of really resonated with us. And so what we actually did was we asked uh, six of your colleagues, our colleagues, um, to share with us their core value, their North Star. And so we are going to share those with you. So we have Dr. Chokesy, Dr. Little, Dr. Cohen. Um, Dr. Teach, Dr. Cora Bramble, and Dr. Smith, who most of them are here. Um, and so thank you so much for sharing with us your North Star. And you guys will be hearing from them um, later on in the presentation. Um, my uh, core value North Star that I go by is integrity. And I'm going to leave Lenore to tell us about her. I am. And then, service. And then she's going to start talking about courses. So once you've chosen your core value, 
I want you to think about something that you're doing in your personal or professional life that leads you to having a core statement or a narrative. And so this could be research-oriented, it could be clinical-oriented, advocacy, education. But the core statement is a statement of purpose, and it drives your organization, your mission, your project, and it helps your organization, your clinic, your specific project have a idea of what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And then you can very specifically and succinctly share that core statement with others to allow people to further understand what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So I want you to think about something that you're working on in your personal or professional life. So what is the specific service, product, activity, process, or outcomes that you are offering? Who are the participants or the beneficiaries of your project? What is the problem that you are trying to address? And what is unique about the solution that you're proposing? So in the next three slides, I'm going to share three core statement videos from participants in my cohort. These were actually pretty early on, but I picked early on videos because they also share their core statement and core value which I think ties in nicely with what Monty was just talking about. The first classmate that I would like to share is David Smith. He was the CEO, well, he is the CEO of Cotopaxi, and he runs a for-profit organization that also donates part of its proceeds to support community development and also provides grant programs for different countries to successfully improve the human condition. Of note, of the three core statements that I will share with you, none of us are talking about our primary organization. So Davis is not talking about Cotopaxi. The next individual is not talking about their organization. I will share mine. I'm not talking about Children's National. But we're talking about our presidential leadership project so a service-oriented project that we were working on for purposes of this program. So let me show you Davis's. Hey everyone, this is Davis Smith. I am developing a program that supports recently resettled refugee entrepreneurs in their efforts to start and grow small businesses. And I'm working to connect them with their new communities through mentorship, workshops, and a culminating new venture competition. Uh, this ties back to my core value of empathy. I grew up in the developing world uh, because of my dad's job and ended up spending my entire childhood and much of my adult life in developing countries. I believe that all humans have equal value and equal worth. And um, I'm working closely with the refugee communities here in Salt Lake City where I'm based and uh, something I'm very passionate about. So uh, I look forward to seeing you guys all later this week. So you get a sense in about 15 to 20 seconds, a very succinct core statement of what Davis is trying to do, followed by a little bit of an explanation of his core value and why the work that he's doing is so important to him. Next, I'd like to share a non-for-profit CEO, Lisa Hallett, who is a classmate of mine. For those of you who aren't aware, Gold Star families are families who've lost someone in the line of service. So Lisa lost her husband in active military duty, leaving her and her three kids as survivors. She has then since gone on and founded a corporation called Wear Blue Run to Remember, and this is her core statement. It's Lisa Hallett. My military focused nonprofit, Wear Blue Run Tree Member, is growing a Gold Star Youth Mentorship Program to empower post 9 11 children of fallen military in building resilience and self identity through a nine week run focused program with the support of a currently serving member of our armed forces. My core value is resilience, the process of adapting while in the face of adversity. And the reality is that these children have made an incredible sacrifice at an early age. 
and it's essential that we ensure that a second sacrifice, the sacrifice of their potential is not made. By investing in their resilience, we ensure that they are able to live a healthy and happy life forward. Even more, by investing in their resilience, their ability to overcome heartbreak and tragedy, we empower them to take their life experience and let it become catalysts for dynamic growth and change, making them uniquely poised to be incredible and meaningful contributors to their society, their communities, both locally and at large. <laughs> Hi, gang, it's Lisa Hallett. My military. So I thought, as someone who's not in business, I've always been in medicine that learning from for-profit and non-for-profit business persons on how to clearly and succinctly communicate a message was a really important skill for me. So this next one is mine. I will say this is the second week of the program, and I feel like I struggled a little bit in comparison. It's not something that's inherently um, tied in with the work that we do, but I think it's really important. And so my um, leadership project was based on perinatal mental health or postpartum depression screening in our emergency department. So when I was a fellow, I noticed that we had a lot of parents coming in with something to the extent of fussy baby, where we did our due diligence and did an exam and vital signs and nothing was wrong with the baby, but we tried to reassure the mother, in most cases, or the caregiver and the caregiver was often not reassured. And so I hypothesized that this might be something else that was going on, a missed opportunity, and did a pilot screening program um, using the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale and found that 27% of our mothers presenting with infants less than or equal to six months of age screened positive on the Edinburgh for postpartum depression, with 7% having suicidal thoughts. Um, further, on adjusted odds ratio, we found that these mothers who screen positive are actually presenting to the emergency department more frequently. So when I um, entered this program, I had just completed that study and was trying to figure out how I can make my personal leadership project universal postpartum depression screening in our pediatric emergency department. <clears throat> Hi, it's Lenore in DC. Our team, the Perinatal Mental Health Task Force, aims to implement universal postpartum depression screening in order to provide early interventions and resources for mothers who screen positive for postpartum depression. Our core value is teamwork. Without the hard work of physicians, nurses, social workers, and community partners, we cannot provide mothers and their families the help and resources that they need. We aim to normalize, validate, and provide hope. Thanks, looking forward to seeing you soon. So you can see how in this video, I tried to take lessons learned from our non-for-profit and for-profit business partners to succinctly and clearly communicate a message of what I'm trying to do in the clinical space. And so when you are thinking about this as you go home today, I want you to think about what you are trying to accomplish in your professional or personal life. Think about your core values, think about your core statement. You should be able to very succinctly in 15 to 20 seconds say a message that relates what you're trying to do and it should be clear, concise, memorable and relatable and persuasive. We extended this concept of the core narrative or core statement to the power of a narrative. So if you are having the opportunity to do more than just a quick pitch, to introduce yourself to someone and really explain what you're doing, you'll want to be prepared with some sort of story or narrative to really back up the concept of what you're doing. I think as physicians, this is something that should be very easy for us. You know, we have a unique opportunity to get um, very personal insights into a lot of our patient and families' lives. And so it was very easy for me to be able to tell stories about patients that I've seen in the emergency department, obviously in a HIPAA-compliant way. Um, but through this program, we did spend a little bit of time working on the power of a narrative, using something specifically called a story spine or the Pixar pitch. It is um, set in this structure beginning 
event, middle, climax, end. And it might feel a little bit cheesy to say once upon a time, but one day because of that, you're not going to say that when you're talking to a grant funder or a, a dean for an education school or anything of that nature, but it gives you a sense of the format of how you should flow through your narrative. And so before I turn it back over to Monsi, I'll show you my story spine or narrative that relates to the project that I just uh, showed you. And so right around the time that I participated in this program, I also had a unique opportunity to um, <clears throat> work with the Washington Post on this article. At the same time, they uh, invited me to be a medical perspective on this topic. But I think more importantly, the Gatos family shared a story, their personal story of tragedy and how maternal depression really affected the lives of their family. And so I'd like to thank the Gatos, share, uh, Gatos family for sharing their story and show you my story spine. Once upon a time, Shilane and her husband wanted a big family. They had three beautiful little girls and they were expecting their fourth child when they learned during a routine 12 week ultrasound that the baby's heart had stopped beating. They were devastated. In the days that followed, Shilane blamed herself. She worried that she'd let her husband down and she told her sister that she felt like a failure. She took time off work stopped sleeping, and two weeks later, she ended her life. But one day, doctors realized that deaths like Shilane's didn't need to happen. One day, doctors realized that postpartum depression was the most common complication of childbirth in the United States and associated with poor maternal, infant, and family outcomes. One day, doctors realized that suicide accounts for up to 20% of postpartum deaths. Because of that, doctors realized that identification and early intervention was imperative for successful treatment. Because of that, they created a multidisciplinary perinatal mental health task force to focus on systems change and healthcare solutions to prevent and treat postpartum depression until finally postpartum depression screening was universal, until finally doctors were able to normalize, validate, and offer hope for postpartum depression. And ever since then, women realized that they were not alone, they were not to blame, and with help, they would get better. So again, you wouldn't necessarily use that exact Pixar pitch format, but you can see how I used my core value to drive my core statement and follow with the power of a story and a narrative. So tying this section up, in terms of the art of communication, when you're thinking about your personal project, your research, your advocacy, your education, your clinical work, you need to know your audience, know your story, be prepared with a story that you can share, your narrative, and have that story be relatable and relevant. Speak a language that's going to resonate with the person that you're talking to. Be authentic, repeat your message, and then keep things in perspective. Um, so we're gonna shift gears uh, just a little bit um, and talk about leadership style. Um, obviously part of the program was learning about different leadership styles. And I think the biggest thing for us is really cultivating our own leadership style and recognizing what we are good at, what we're not good at, what we want to work on. Um, so through PLS, we actually had the opportunity to learn about the various leadership styles and specifically in the eyes of presidents. So each president led their administration differently. They faced challenges differently. They made decisions differently. And we were able to learn from people that closely worked with them about their leadership style, how they've evolved throughout the presidency, different tactics that they used. And I thought this was really interesting because I think that we often think of leaders as the people that are on the top, the people that are bold, the people that are extroverted. Um, they're not allowed to fail. They're not allowed to make mistakes. They know everything. And that might have been the traditional definition of a leader, but I think as time has kind of moved, the definition of leadership is evolving, um, and it encompasses a lot more than um, what, uh, what we think of. 
So these are kind of some leadership styles. It's not an all-encompassing list, but you have visionary, you have autocratic, you have democratic, you have servant, hands-off, coaching leaders, transformational leaders, pace setters, transactional, commanding, you know, and this is just to name a few. Um, and I think one of the things that was the most important for us was that the best leaders out there are the ones that are able to take a bunch of styles, mix it up, and know exactly what situation um, each different style might work. And then when we think about styles, like they might vary, the personality traits might vary, but when you think about the best leaders out there, they're really the ones that have that core value, that like North Star that guide them throughout their every single day actions. And that's really the foundation of leadership. So that's kind of why we talked about core value, core statement, being able to communicate your message effectively, because without that, no matter how amazing your qualities are, um, you're not going to be able to lead effectively. And so... We actually asked some of our colleagues, um, the same ones from before, to um, talk about their leadership styles and then also tactics that they have found that can increase their influence, impact, or success. So we would like each of them that are here to kind of briefly share with you what they shared with us, and then I'll read some of the ones that um, for people that were not here. So if we could start with Dr. Cheech. Good morning. I, I guess I would describe myself as sort of a democratic servant. I try to uh, uh, engage a team and, and make sure everybody on that team feels heard and everybody shares that uh, common purpose of, uh, of, of service and that we motivate each other thereby. Smith is right behind. Hi. <laughs> Mine, I would say, too, is on a servant. Um, I think especially here at Children to the benefit of, there's such amazing talent and wonderful people here. Um, as a leader, it's really how do I unleash, you know, that ability? How do I remove those barrier, barriers so people can excel and do their thing? Because if I tried to push that down of what I wanted, it would work horribly. Um, but allowing everyone to rise to the top and do their best is what makes us all, you know, amazing organization. Thank you. Our Bramble. I would say my main leadership style is servant leadership. That all that means is that I feel that I work for you all, that my goal is less centered on me and more on the people around me. Um, I have the added challenge of being both a woman and minority, and that adds a layer of complexity. Um, being a servant leader, it's important that people don't misunderstand it to mean that you're a pushover. It just means that that is an intentional style, it's an authentic style. And that's what Brown did. Dr. Little? Yeah, I've got a mic back here. Mic. <laughs> um, I uh, described my leadership style as democratic. And I think what I was thinking with that was that I really look to all the people that I'm working with and want to hear lots of different perspectives and ultimately maintain transparency in all the decisions that I make. Because I think that when you're a part of a team, it's hard to feel like there's decisions coming um, that you didn't have a role in RSA in, especially when my job is quite a different than say, the residents that I'm working with. And yeah, so that's why. Thank you. Um, is Dr. Nate Jones here by chance? No? Okay. So um, he works with us in the ER, and so I was just going to kind of read um, what he said, but he focuses on being adaptable and innovative. Um, he described his style, his style as creativity. Um, he often seeks out new approaches to old problems and then develops a realistic and achievable vision that can be communicated and effectively um, uh, uh, taught to other members of his team. And he said that he really likes to push people to be outside of their comfort zone. He usually seeks to create an environment or culture where people feel safe um, and they're allowed to ask questions. And then Dr. Choksi, who I think could not make it either, um, she was talking about how she's mostly goal-oriented and um, collaborative such her style. And then one of the key tactics that really has worked for her is communication, focusing on communication of goals, visions, outcomes, objectives, basically seeing the big picture um, and getting input from all levels and um, being flexible. So thank you guys all for sharing. Um, and as you can see, all of these really successful um, leaders within our institution had not only different core values, but different leadership styles, um, things that they focused on. And, um, 
I really kind of urge you guys when you guys go home to really think about what is your leadership style? Um, what are things that you want to work on? Um, how do you challenge yourself? How do you make tough decisions? And also, what is the style of the people that you work with um, as well around you? Because if you know that, then you're going to be able to work together effectively to achieve your common goals. Um, with that, I'm going to leave it over to Lenore to talk about teams and stakeholders. Before I transition, we should have asked this at the beginning, but it occurred to me as we were going around talking about leadership styles. I'm just curious by a show of hands, how many persons in this room have received formalized leadership training, either a workshop, a course, um, something of that nature? Yeah. It's really interesting. So a lot of our hospital leadership, not so much with our trainees, but you can see why this type of leadership training and these concepts might be very important to sort of hone and refine your skills in order to have the most success and impact in the work that you're doing. Um, so with this, we wanted to say, all right, you've got your core statement, your core value, your narrative, you're learning about your personal leadership style. Now it's time to build your teams and invest your stakeholders. So this is just a very brief <laughs> whirlwind. Again, we can't spend 120 hours with you today, but a sense of how to build your teams and invest your stakeholders. So together with the team, you can really accomplish much more than going alone. So you need partnerships and mechanisms to advance your goals. So we don't get formally taught about operations in medical school, but it's really important to um, build your teams out. And in order to do that successfully, you need a common goal. They call this the common pain here. But what exactly are you rallying around and what are you trying to do? You need someone to be able to convene that group and then representatives of uh, different stakeholders in that arena who are trying to also work towards that common pain. You need people who are committed, working towards that clearly defined purpose. And then you need to figure out how you're going to approach this problem, forming a formal charter, having that, that northbound train or north star, and then a common, clearly understood communication of an information base of what you're trying to achieve and how you're trying to get there. So in the emergency department, I often, from a clinical standpoint, will work to uh, the common pain, it's not really a common pain, but of uh, providing good quality care for our patients. And so in that way, I build my team, and that's our nurses, physicians, OTPT sometimes, social workers, the families, to address the common goal of providing safe and quality care for our patients. When I worked with my perinatal mental health task force, including Lee Beers, Penny, and many, many others in the hospital, our common goal was to identify and treat postpartum depression with improved linkage, care, and resources. And then our stakeholders were a multidisciplinary team, nurses, physicians, social workers, multiple hospital divisions. We had the perinatal mental health task force, parents and families, and community partners like Mary Center, Postpartum Support International, and GW5 Trimesters Clinic. Each stakeholder may value something different, and you need to think about that. So what is really driving that stakeholder to affect the change? And you may not all have the same motivations or reasons for addressing the common pain, but it's still important that you're really seeing that North Star or common goal. And then try, try to frame your goals in a way that your stakeholder values. Um, so again, for example, if you're taking care of a patient, you might say to a parent, my goal for you today is for your child to be safe and healthy. And a lot of times just reminding them that you want the same thing, you're on the same page, but you might not agree with exactly how to get there will be a good pause so that you can kind of reset and rediscuss what you're doing that day for that patient. So in that sense, how can you be more influential? You need to have a clear sense of what you want to change, what your stakeholders want or need, what your stakeholders value, what your own sources of power and influence are, and how you can increase that influence. I just want to quickly talk about kind of the importance of diversity, which is something that we learned um, throughout this program and probably all of us recognize this in our daily lives. But one key element for success of a team is diversity. 
And our class, um, our PLS class, the North PLS class, consisted of 60 people that came from all over the country, had different backgrounds, different races, different genders, different sexual orientations. They belonged to different political parties, um, different jobs, different interests, different passions. And that was really the beauty of this program. And you would think that, you know, did that lead to heated discussions? Did that lead to people kind of trying to convince someone from the other side to think their way? But not at all. It actually led to really, really rich discussions and people being tolerant, people being understanding, people trying to understand, you know, someone else's viewpoint. Um, and, you know, and like I said, I mean, these rich connections are probably the most beautiful part of this program and also taught us um, the importance of diversity in creating a working group. So when you think about um, a building a team, um, you know, there are people of different skill sets, people with different talents, different expertise, that's going to make your team very strong. It's going to lead to innovation. Um, it's going to ex increase exposure to different types of people, and that's going to help, one, you know, um, eliminate bias or at least kind of help you work on your unconscious bias, as I know we've talked about um, in multiple grand rounds in the past. I mean, we all have this. Um, it's going to lead to more engagement, more employee satisfaction, reduced turnover. Um, so really the key, I think, for us is that diversity is key. Diversity is important to success. So <clears throat> an extension of not only figuring out who your stakeholders are in building your team and then realizing that diversity is cultivating your network. And so I just put a really brief example of two of my very important personal networks here. The top is a lot of our emergency medicine faculty or staff. <clears throat> and then the bottom is actually my PLS cohort. So in the top picture, I rely on these folks for almost everything. It can be if we're having a really terrible clinical shift. They're my kind of cheerleaders. They're the people that I go to if I need advice or help with a patient. Um, they've mentored me with research. We've talked a lot about advocacy. These are the people that I go to. And I actually, I think it's worth saying, but I think we're pretty lucky that we have, at least I feel, we have a very supportive group of faculty who are really intelligent, really motivated, really passionate in child health care and changing the world in some instances. And so there's not a single person, I think, on the top uh, photo that I haven't individually spoken to at some point for something. And then I would like to think that vice versa, if they ever needed something, they could come to me. Um, the bottom team is the cohort of PLS persons. And I will say that this has been a really unique and strong alumni network for us. Um, it doesn't, for you, have to be PLS. If you think about something that you've participated in that's really meaningful to you, I want to encourage you to continue to cultivate that network. And don't be afraid to call on them if you're having a really hard day or you're having problems with something or you're struggling with something. Um, I recently got a little frustrated with um, one of my projects and thought that actually I would go outside of the children's network to ask my business colleagues how would you approach this problem in the business world? And I actually got some really sound advice that I was able to use in my hospital project. So I just want you to think outside the box a little bit about your network. And then making sure that you have cheerleaders. So we're all going to have bad days. Um, Lisa Howitt, the uh, CEO of Wear Blue, we all felt so passionate about her mission that 20 out of the 60 of us ran the Marine Corps Marathon, which is just insane. And so in the upper um, right corner, um, I'm hugging a really close um, friend from PLS, uh, Mary Redding, who had never run anything more than a 5K, and she finished the marathon. I think it was in seven hours and 30 minutes, but she finished, which is just so incredible to me. So. Um, we don't need to belabor this, but I think that networking gets a really bad rep or a bad name. So it's more than just a business card. It's not about backstabbing. It's not about getting ahead. It's really meant to be relationship building. You should be your authentic self. You don't need to pretend to be somebody else. It's really about collaboration and rallying around your common goals. And so that's also why it's so important for you to know what your goals are and what is really important to you and what you want to accomplish in your career. When you're networking, you should have a quick elevator pitch. And so it's not all that dissimilar to having a core message, but you should be able to communicate 
who you are to someone you've never met very quickly and very succinctly. So for me, I could say, Dr. Cora Bramble, I know you, but my name is Dr. Lenore Jarvis. I work at Children's National. I feel very passionate about perinatal mental health. I think that universal postpartum depression screening in the emergency department will provide adequate linkage of care to mothers and caregivers and resources and support that they need. I hear that your institution is doing some perinatal mental health screening. Maybe we can talk. How can I help you? It's something very quick and succinct like that it can be really meaningful and go a long way. Um, when I'm engaging with community partners that, uh, for me, with my advocacy hat, sometimes they don't understand some of the difficulties or troubles that we're having at the hospital or institution. And I might offer myself as a resource, and I may offer even to give them a tour of the hospital with permission of persons, of course, in this room. Um, but just to say, we need to really kind of um, clearly communicate to you what we're experiencing and then come up with a plan to address this common pain or common goal. And having a mentorship team is really important. So um, not one person is going to provide everything that you need for your mentorship. So for me, I have a research mentor. I have a clinical mentor. I have advocacy mentors. I actually have someone that I jokingly call a life coach who reminds me to like do my dishes and spend time with friends and family um, and not work all the time. <laughs> um, but it just, we thought that this was a really important point to make, that you're not in on this alone. You have your network, you have your team, you have your stakeholders, but you also have your mentors. Um, can I just talk a little bit about imposter syndrome? Um, do people in the audience, have you heard about imposter syndrome? Do you know what it is? Some of you, some of you yes, some of you know. Um, basically, imposter syndrome is something that I think a lot of us can fall um, subject to. You know, we're around people at, you know, at Children's, at PLS that are really highly successful, um, really smart, really intelligent. It's probably easy for some of us to feel like we are not that, you know, we, we don't have that. So imposter syndrome is really the inability to believe that one's success is deserved or legitimately has been achieved by one's own kind of being or accomplishment. And a lot of times people that experience imposter syndrome, um, they feel that they would be considered a fraud in the eyes of someone else if, you know, if they kind of think that, oh, like, they accomplished it. Um, so we wanted to talk about that because I think, like we talked about, like, you know, being around here can easily make people feel that way. And I myself struggle with this on a daily basis. And I wouldn't say that I've mastered not seeing or not feeling that I have imposter syndrome. Um, but really recognizing that, so if you guys are struggling with that, recognize it. Challenge yourself to think about what do you know? What can you bring to the table? Because each one of you can. Um, and I just want to kind of put it into a little perspective. Um, Lenore and I both spend time lobbying on the Hill. And when you think about lobbying on the Hill, do we know all the laws? No. Do we know exactly how the government works, the infrastructure, besides seventh grade, like government class? No, not really. Um, so when we go there, you know, we think, okay, well, we're, we're nothing. We know nothing. You know, we're speaking to a bunch of congressmen, staffers that know everything, the intricacies of how things work. How can we make a difference? How can what we want to do, um, what we want to say, how could we even get to that? And so the last time I lobbied, we lobbied about gun control. I knew nothing about the Dickey Amendment and its negative consequences. I knew nothing about the assault bans weapon and why we should, you know, vote yes. Um, I learned about that probably the day prior to meeting with the congressmen and staffers on the Hill who knew much more than I did. But it doesn't mean that, you know, what I'm bringing to the table can't influence or impact um, the children that, you know, we are fighting for. Um, so just kind of, you know, think about it in that perspective. It doesn't have to be lobbying. It can be anything that you do on a daily basis, anything that you're passionate about. Um, but you always have something to offer. So you, you have medical knowledge, you have the background. You know the consequences, consequences that patients face if we don't make the changes that we wanna make. You know the consequences that patients face if they don't get the services they need. Um, and most importantly, you have the narrative. We talked about the power of the narrative. You have those stories that you see on a daily basis and you should use those to talk about or to talk to the people that you wanna influence, to talk to the people that you're trying to get to be on the team. Um, and then also just recognize that, you know, maybe you don't have something that the person next to you has. Maybe you don't have the skill set that that person has, but that is the definition of diversity, right? So you might not have what they have, but you are going to bring something else to the table. And that's kind of why diversity is so important. That's the definition of diversity. Um, 
And then just, you know, really quick, I think all of us probably saw this in med school, um, this slide, but doctors, healthcare professionals rank the highest when it comes to ethics. So people actually look at nurses, pharmacists, physicians, um, and they think that we're ethical, we're honest, you know, we're doing good. So use that to your advantage. Use that to influence, um, you know, people and get your message across. And then just some tips for the trainees out there. Um, you know, I would really urge you guys to like find your passion, think about it, think about your core value, your, your core statement, your North Star, um, find your passion and then get involved. So whether it's a local organization, whether it's you leading a committee, whether it's you joining a national organization, get involved and kind of build your network. Um, and then keep learning. It doesn't mean that, you know, you don't know anything. Obviously we're in an environment where learning is constant um, and just know that, you know, that's really important, and then sustain your team, create your network, sustain them. Um, these are just some kind of, you know, learning tidbits that we learned about um, along the way during PLS. I'm not going to belabor these. Um, I really just kind of want to bring the take home to you, which, um, as we talked about before, determine your core values, make your core statement, find opportunities to lead authentically, you know, cultivate, develop your leadership style. Really think about it, because you don't think about that in a structured way I think in medicine at all. So really kind of think about that and just know that you are a child health expert. You can make a difference. You can offer yourself as a resource because you, you know a lot. Um, so lastly, just know that your leadership can impact children and whether it's through advocacy, whether it's clinical work, whether it's research, we are all working together to make a difference in children's health. And I keep that in mind. Um, these are just some books that we thought um, we would share with you that were um, helpful to us. And we actually have a list of lots of articles, lots of books that we learned about. So please feel free to message us, email us um, if you guys are interested in reading more. Um, we're happy to share those with you. We're happy to share these slides with you as well. Um, and that is it. If there's any questions. Wow, what an inspiring way to, to start Wednesday morning. Congratulations to both of you. I feel all fired up, I think, as one president uh, once said. <laughs> um, can, you, can you give an example, uh, each of you, of how your participation in the program, a real concrete example, uh, changed uh, your professional uh, life here at Children's National? So I think that um, one of the things I was really struggling with, um, like I talked about, was imposter syndrome. I, I feel like when I'm around a really amazing and talented group of people, I feel like I, I don't have that. I don't have that to offer. And I think that truly, to be honest with you, throughout the course of PLS, you know, learning from the people that were around me, um, that I also felt that same way. I mean, these people are amazing. They're awe-inspiring. Um, they were really my cheerleaders. They were the ones that were like, you know what, you need to go back to your institution. You need to go back to whatever project that you're working on and think that you do know how to make a difference. And I think that that shift, that kind of mentality, like I said, I'm not an expert at it. I have not mastered it in any way, shape, or form. Um, but that was probably the biggest thing for me because I definitely met people that felt that way maybe 10 years, 15 years, 20 years prior because people are of all different ages and it's all different career trajectories. Um, and then knowing that they kind of were able to work through that made me feel like I also can work through that. I, I hate to echo the same thing, but I also, um, the first kind of week of this program in particular, just sort of felt like somebody screwed up. And when I was in a room with just really, really amazing people, um, I was just like, somebody made a mistake. Like, I don't know how like my paper got shuffled with somebody else, but um, it took a little while, maybe like uh, out of six modules, maybe yeah. module two or three for me to really feel comfortable in a room of really amazing people. And I think that that's really important that, you know, we may not be CEOs of huge corporations with multi-million dollar budgets, but, you know, we're, you know, clinical physicians, um, we're very smart, we're very intelligent, we're motivated, and we, you know, both Monty and I are really driven by making a difference um, to lots of different aspects of patient populations. But um, I think other concrete things are um, just this felt like a gift 
to have the opportunity to participate in this program. And when you have people, you know, like Davis, like Lisa Hallett, who have their big corporations, but then we're working on these personal leadership uh, projects that were just totally separate of what their main organization um, was doing, and listening to the ways, the concrete ways in which they were really trying to have impact or difference, um, these, you know, global service leadership projects, you left like if you didn't leave doing something big and great that you were um, like squandering the opportunity. And so, um, you know, every time I meet with uh, people in my cohort, I'm just left with excitement and hearing about what they're doing and what I can be driven to do in my own personal and professional life. And then to know that it's not insurmountable, that you're going to face challenges and diversity and hurdles and um, people who don't think exactly the way that you think, but that you um, now, I, we now have tools to um, try to reframe. How do we get on the same page? How do we work towards a common goal? If I'm getting um, stumbled or blocked up somewhere, who do I go to? And I'm a little less shy about it. So I think before I might not have been as quick to ask for help. And maybe that's also a physician mentality. Like I'm an ER doc. I can, I can do it all. I'm going to go run this code and then like, you know, do this thing in room 17 or whatever it is, but you can ask for help. And it can be something really small, like, you know, I really don't understand how um, grant funding works. Can somebody explain it to me? Um, I'm really having struggle, like struggling with the introduction on this manuscript, whatever it is. So I think the concrete things that I would say that I took home are don't have imposter syndrome, don't be afraid to ask for help, um, and kind of think big. Yeah. Sounds like an amazing opportunity. So I'm going to put you guys on the spot, especially since now you're not shy about sharing your opinion. So what can oh, children so do no, as so shy. <laughs> <laughs> what can children do as an institution in terms of sharing what you've shared um, on a more systematic basis in order to develop exactly what you have uh, sort of discussed this whole hour, because I'm certain that uh, you, would, you had an amazing network experience and being able to talk to all these CEOs and be like, wow, this, you know what, children should do, blah, blah, blah. What do you guys think? I think that, um, you know, we as pediatricians, we as an institution, like we talked about, have a common goal. Um, we want to make the lives of children better, right? And I think we all know that, and that's really like what we do in our daily lives, but I think children, um, you know, or any institution um, kind of surrenders to working in silos. And that sometimes can be a detriment. Sometimes it can be, you know, an asset depending on what project it is. But if you're working in silos and you're working on the same thing, um, then it might actually be a detriment because you're not able to get the skill sets of different people in different groups. So I think children should really, one, focus on networking between, you know, different, I guess, departments. Um, that would be probably one thing. Um, really getting to know colleagues or coworkers in other areas, and then still having that common mission, right, which is I want to make the lives of children better and whatever it might be. Um, I think that would be probably one concrete thing that I would say is that figure out how we can network within <laughs> children's itself. Because networking we think about outside, I really think that I don't know everyone at children. Nobody knows everyone at children's, right? So how can we network within ourselves? You know, I, I would just add that I think that um, as we spoke in the beginning, we are leaders, we're all leaders in this room to some capacity. And until some of these programs over the last year or so, I had not received formal leadership training. And then when I did that informal raise of hands in the middle, um, the majority of persons that raised their hand in this room were our hospital administrative staff for the most part. Um, and so I think it's just a testament to maybe the importance of carving out some time. And uh, I know it's I don't want anyone to like throw a stone at me or anything, but um, our residents and our trainees are very, um, you have a very robust curriculum. I'm not trying to overtax you in any way, but I just think that these concepts are um, really important. And so maybe carving out some time for some formalized leadership training. And I think that, you know, when Michael O'Leary and his colleagues developed this cohort, they were very mindful about the curriculum and the leadership training and what kind of lessons and take homes they wanted us to learn. I and mean, how we were going to learn them. So I think that 
actually the people in this room are almost like another PLS cohort. Like the people in this room are really amazing. And you've done a lot of kind of individual exciting uh, things. And so how can we um, give in particular our trainees the tips and tools to sort of take it to the next level? And that could be through formalized educational um, leadership curricula. Um, and even maybe bringing in some of our business colleagues to help teach some of those courses. And we learned some of these lessons through the presidents, through some of their administrators. We did it um, lecture style. We had some that were podium or platform presentations. Um, we also had some that were panel discussions. And um, learning from other leaders, um, like even Sylvia Matthews Burwell, you know, we had David Rubenstein. We had other individuals that came in and talked with us. And so I think children could do something similar. And even this Grand Rounds, I think, is a little bit unique insofar as a lot of our Grand Rounds aren't about kind of leadership and these sorts of, um, you know, um, leadership lessons learned. It's more often about QI, safety, science, et cetera. Um, and I'm not saying our Grand Round series are, are excellent, so that's not the take home. But um, how can we continue to infuse some of these other necessary skills into our curricula? 